Hey, everybody. Welcome to Found Vernier Sensors. We are so excited to go into this webinar today. As folks are getting settled into the Zoom room, I'd love to direct you to the bottom of your Zoom window. You'll see a chat button. It kind of looks like a chat bubble. Go ahead and click that. Make sure that the to section is set to everyone. Um, and let me know Let's see, what is the weather like? Wherever in the world you are, what is what is the weather like? Here it has been very cloudy and cool for an August in the summer. I don't know. Yeah, it rained all day. Okay, so we're kind of in it together. Okay, very sunny and hot for Aaron. Wow, sunny and 95. Okay, so it looks like we're on two sides of the spectrum here. And uh, just to give some context, I ask that you set your chat to everyone because during this webinar, we will be answering your questions in chat. Um, but so that Colleen and Melissa don't look like they're talking to themselves, go ahead and make sure your chat sends to everyone so we can all read your question and know what your question is. All right. Oh, someone feels like they're in Dante's Inferno. I am praying for you, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds awful. That does sound yeah. awful. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's great. All right, well, to make the most of our time today, let's get into some housekeeping items and then I'll pass you off to our fabulous presenters. Uh, two quick things I want to cover with you. First and foremost, you will get a recording of today's webinar. Um, you can access that recording both on our website and our YouTube channel, but because you registered, you will also get a recording emailed to your inbox. So keep an eye on your inbox. It'll take us about three to five business days to edit that, put it on YouTube, all that good stuff. But as soon as it's ready, I'm going to email it on out to you along with a resources folder. Um, and that just has today's presentation so you can follow along. I'm going to drop that resources folder in the chat as soon as I'm done talking today. So you can click through the presentation, click any links, all that good stuff. Um, and then, of course, we would love to answer your questions. So please put any and all questions into the chat. Um, we'll keep an eye on that. But if we happen to miss your question, please feel free to reach out. You can reach us at support at vernier.com. That being said, I'll pass you off to our uh, presenters. And thank you so much for joining us. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Colleen, and uh, today we're we have a bit of an agenda today. Uh, we have a lot of information we're going to go over. Um, just so you're prepared for this, this is mostly going to be what we call the talking head type webinar, where we're just going to go over a lot of information for you. Um, and the biggest thing, like what Dylan said, do not hesitate to put questions into the webinar chat. Um, Melissa and I will go back and forth uh, answering those questions and make sure everybody gets what they need. So um, first, we're just going to do some a general introduction of ourselves. We're going to go over some, you know, essentials kind of things to help you get started. Um, look at the stuff. Isn't it neat? And yes, I had to pull a Little Mermaid uh, line in there for looking at everything that you could find in your closet. Best ways to use and optimize those tools and resources that we have for you. And then also going over a little bit of troubleshooting, not too much because we actually have done a whole webinar on that and kind of how to get further support and some tailored training. So to start, Melissa, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, I am the director of chemistry here at Vernier. I've been here about 14 years. Before that, I taught at the college level, and uh, I now do a lot of, it's, Vernier is a pretty small company, so we wear a lot of hats. I do a lot mm -hmm. of trainings. Um, I also do a lot of product development and curriculum development, so uh, but I am one of the chemists. So if you uh, shoot an email to chemistry at Rainier.com or call and ask to speak to a chemist, <laughs> you're very likely going to get me. Um, and I will, like Colleen said, be monitoring the chat very closely. So if you have any questions at any point, please throw them in there. <laughs> and I'm Colleen. I'm a biology and environmental science specialist here at Vernier. Um, I taught as for six years in Spring Branch ISD in Houston, Texas. And uh, I've been that with Vernier now for uh, 11 years. And you can see, just like Melissa, lots of different hats. We are involved in so many different things. 
um, because mostly since most of us have taught, we want to make sure we kind of have that educator perspective in everything that we do to help support you. So one thing we wanted to make sure everybody was aware of is you are currently attending a webinar, but all of our webinars are posted on our website. Um, and you can find them on our website under educator training and going to videos. That's where you're going to find some, um, basically you can then filter those videos based on your subject area, a topic, things like that. And I, we put a couple links in this presentation to two uh, webinars primarily that we think uh, most people will find very useful because we had a lot of questions about pH sensors within um, people's registration. So uh, there's this great webinar about pH sensor care and feeding that we wanna make sure you have access to. And Melissa and I've done uh, a couple webinars on sensor storage and maintenance. And this covers a lot of the uh, kind of how-tos of checking your sensors, seeing how they're doing and what their health is, and kind of generally a good, um, good practices when it comes to storing your sensors for long periods of time. We also have a blog that is quite active. Um, that you can find under blog on our main web page there. And there are a couple blog posts we found that could be very useful. Again, top five pH questions and generally um, some information about successful implementation of pro probeware in your classroom. Uh, we try to have a featured blog post a few times a month. So it's constantly changing and constantly up to date. And a lot of times we'll have some great resources available for you there. Um, to get some ideas of different ways to use sensors and how to teach your subject areas. So one of the things that Melissa and I deal with a lot is we get a lot of phone calls from people who, or emails or chats that are like, I opened up a cabinet and I just found all of this equipment and I have no idea what it is. And one of the things we really try to help guide you towards is to make sure you contact us. That's what we're here for. We're here to support you as educators. And we wanna make sure that you can use that equipment. Because one of the things that we hate the most is hearing equipment that is in a box and has been sitting in that box for 10 years and it looks like it never even has been used. The twist ties are still on the cables and they obviously never got removed. Perfect sign that something never got touched. And so one of the things we recommend is first contacting us or just even going to our website. We have a lot of amazing resources on the website to help get you going and get you started in using your equipment. Uh, so today we're gonna kind of go over, you know, what do you have? What labs are here? Does it still work and how do I use it? So one of the first things you need to be aware of is some different terminology that we use. So one of the main words, the terms that we use a lot is called an interface. And an interface is something that a sensor is going to connect directly to, to be used. And we basically can divide our interfaces into three different categories. You have single sensor interfaces. These set interfaces can only connect a single sensor. You have multi-direct interfaces. These are some interfaces that have to connect directly to a computer or another computing device and the sensor plugs into them. Or you have a standalone interface. And these I here are kind of the different eras of the standalone interface, if you will. We have the original LabQuest, the LabQuest 2, and then what we currently have is a LabQuest 3. Um, with these interfaces, the easy link here is specific for TI calculators. So that would connect to a TI calculator and a uh, sensor could plug in through that. The go link here, again, very similar in shape, except this has a USB end that would plug into a computer or a Chromebook. And again, these are gonna only connect to what we call our analog type sensors. And these are sensors that have an order code that ends in BTA, or should say starts in BTA. 
Um, here with our connected interfaces is the top one here is our Lab Pro. So the Lab Pro is one of our oldest interfaces and sadly it uh, was discontinued quite a while ago, uh, mostly because we just don't have the parts to build them anymore. Um, and their technology is pretty old, so they um, might still work with computers, but their USB technology is too old to even work with Chromebooks. So if you have a Lab Pro, it's a good idea to look into upgrading to either to basically the LabQuest Mini which this is an older version I have on here of a LabQuest Mini, which again, sensors will connect directly to the LabQuest Mini and the LabQuest Mini will connect directly to a computer or a Chromebook in order to give readings with those sensors. All right, so sensors. In sensor land, we basically have two different categories of sensors. We have sensors that are called LabQuest sensors and sensors that are called GoDirect sensors. LabQuest sensors have to connect to a LabQuest interface in order to function. So these are sensors that are going to have a white plug on the end of them. And the reason I have a temperature probe and a motion detector here is because the temperature probe has what we call an analog uh, connector. So it's going to connect to things like the GoLink or any of the other LabQuest interfaces, while the motion detector has a digital port or a digital connection. So it would connect only to the LabQuest interfaces into digital ports, which are very that are basically a mirror opposite of the analog ports. Our GoDirect sensors are sensors that do not need an interface. So they will connect directly to a computer or a Chromebook or an iPad or a phone, and they will connect by Bluetooth, but they also have the ability to connect by USB as well. So if you're using it with a computer or a Chromebook, you can directly connect it to them by USB. Any questions so far? Remember to throw your questions in chat if you have any questions. And uh, I, whoever's not talking will answer them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, next thing we need to talk about is software. And I think, Jose, I'm going to be answering your question here. So for software and apps, so people who've used our stuff in the past might be familiar with the Logger Pro 3 software. Logger Pro 3 software is what we originally used on computers, specifically Mac and Windows. The thing to keep in mind with Logger Pro 3 is that it is now no longer being updated. So what we're seeing is things are going to be um, slowly breaking on it, and we're not going to be able to do any fixes anymore. What we've moved now towards is more of an app-based system, where basically we've taken all the features from Logger Pro and have divided them out into separate individual apps. Then these apps can then be used on any platform. So they can be used on Mac, Windows, um, Chromebooks, they can be used on iPads, they can be used on phones, Android, basically any, oper any operating system they'll be able to run. So graphical analysis is gonna be the one that I would say you, you're going to use for like 95% of your sensors. Majority of the sensors will be used with graphical analysis. And there is a version of graphical analysis that we call Graphical Analysis Pro that has some extra features available in it that is a subscription based, based on an annual subscription. Spectral analysis is gonna be used for spectrometers. Video analysis is a specific web-based app that is used primarily by physics teachers to do a lot of the video analysis features that were present in Logger Pro. 
And Vernier Video Analysis has its separate um, annual subscription with it as well. And then lastly, we have Instrumental Analysis, which is going to be for more of our advanced equipment and instruments typically seen in our uh, advanced chemistry courses. What I tend to recommend people is the majority of what you need to do with data collection and data analysis, you are going to be able to do with the basic graphical analysis app. So another thing we get a lot of questions is more and more schools have moved to Chromebooks. So what do I do if I have a Chromebook? The good news is pretty much all your sensors, if they are from 2002 or newer, will work with a Chromebook. The only thing that does not work with a Chromebook is going to be a Lab Pro. Like I said, the Lab Pro, its USB technology is too old that it cannot actually be functional when connected to a Chromebook. All of the other LabQuest interfaces though and GoLinks will work with the Chromebooks. Our USB sensors also will work with Chromebooks. If you have um, Go, Go Temps or Go Motions, which are uh, USB Direct Connect sensors, those will also work with Chromebooks. All of the Go Direct sensors will work with Chromebooks by Bluetooth and by USB. We also are aware that Google is slowly doing away with all the native apps that it can you could download onto a Chromebook. So the graphical analysis application has now moved to, uh, we also have now a, what we call a progressive web app. So if you go to the Chrome web browser and type in graphical analysis.app, that will actually launch the graphical analysis app in the web browser. So that way students do not have to do any download of an app onto the device. And um, it's a great way to kind of now that Chrome and it's getting away with those different app uh, native apps available on it. I have two links here on the page that um, you can click on after you get the presentation. And these are gonna go over some questions and answers that we've had a lot of, you know, my school is moving to Chromebooks. What I own, will it still work with them? and what data technology do we have that works with Google Chromebooks? So all of that information is really up to date and we constantly are updating that information as well as things kind of start to progress as we're seeing with app changes. All right, so a couple questions here. I have a few. Uh, here's a good one that I think should be answered out loud. Okay. Um, someone wants to know, they have LabQuest uh, 1, the original LabQuest. What are the benefits of updating to LabQuest 3? And it was getting to be a really long answer, me typing it out. So I'll let you tackle <laughs> that one. I, I started it off. <laughs> so one of the biggest things with moving from an original LabQuest to a LabQuest 3, and let me go back in slides here so you can see what we're talking about. So the lab, original LabQuest is the teal one with the tiny screen up here. And the LabQuest 3 is our current standalone interface. So a couple of the advantages of upgrading is one, uh, the LabQuest 3 has Bluetooth technology and um, better uh, Wi-Fi tech, and it has Wi-Fi technology in it. While the original LabQuest, uh, it does not. Um, and it has a lot of the same functionality, it allows you to work away from the lab bench. It's great for field work, things like that. Also, all of the sensors that you used with the original LabQuest will work with the LabQuest 3 as well. We make sure that those sensors are um, usable across the different platforms. The other advantage is that as um, we develop new GoDirect sensors, those Go Direct sensors will work with a LabQuest 3. They will not work with the original LabQuest, primarily because of um, how old the technology in the original LabQuest is. So 
it's kind of one of those I do recommend if you want to have that standalone interface to go ahead and move towards a LabQuest 3, or if you aren't using it away from the lab bench, if you're just using it directly with computers or Chromebooks, then you can actually save a lot of money and just get a LabQuest Mini and use that directly because you wouldn't necessarily need the uh, screen that's available on the standalone unit. Uh, uh, another question I want you to answer before you move on is the if the lab probes lab pros work with current TI calculators. No, they do not. Um, the the lab pros are no longer working with anything current. Um, any of the current TI calculators, especially. All right. Any other? Oh, I see here we have a DIN question. Excellent question. So the, the DIN sensors are um, more than 20 years old. Oh, I don't know why that changed. There we go. Um, the DIN sensors are actually um, from before 2002. So uh, you would have to use those with a LabQuest interface. Um, they will not, and you'd have to use it with a LabQuest interface that is a standalone. They will not work with graphical analysis. Um, and the reason is, is those sensors with that old type of connector on them, they don't what we have say is have auto identification. They don't know that they are, for example, I believe um, you were saying it was a voltage sensor. So that sensor does not know it is a voltage sensor. So you have to be able to tell the program that it is a voltage sensor and that's only available with Logger Pro and on the LabQuest interfaces. I think go ahead. Uh, we have a, right. lot, a lot more to cover. Kelly. Yeah, we're going to cover <laughs> Everyone's asking questions about stuff <laughs> that we're going to talk about. So just keep going. Um, so where can you get uh, the current uh, apps that I was talking about? Well, um, like I said, the progressive web app for graphical analysis, you would just type into your web browser. Um, for the others, if you want to have a native app, you can go to our downloads page. And this is where you can download the native app onto your computer uh, directly. Or if you're using an iPhone or an iPad or an Android tablet, you would go to your appropriate app store and download the Vernier graphical analysis or spectral analysis app from those locations. So what about labs? Um, so one of the big things that we get a lot of questions about is great, I found these sensors, how do I use them? Um, so one thing that a lot of educators don't, don't realize is that when the school purchased a lab book from us, it's a site license. So once the school purchased the book, they have that book forever, along with the updates as we update that book. So the way you can get access to those is by creating an account on our website. So you would go up to the corner here where it says login register. And once you've done that, you want to use your school email because that way we can link it in the system to what the school has purchased already. And then under that, it'll change to my account and you will go to my downloads. And um, as you scroll down, there will be access to the electronic lab books. And what's great is we've been able to update the instructions in those lab books for graphical analysis. So that way, if you are used to using the instructions for say Logger Pro, we have the updated um, graphical analysis instructions that will walk the students through in how to do those exact experiments using the different application. That way you don't have to do the work because we've already done it for you. <laughs> All right, now I'm gonna throw it over to Melissa here. Yeah, we're gonna switch gears and talk a little bit more sensor specific. So if you do have more questions about software or lab books, instructions about Logger Pro to Chromebooks, throw those in the chat, Colleen will answer those and she'll interrupt me if uh, I need to address something, but we're gonna shift gears to sensors. 
Um, so again, I just want to reiterate that, oh, Colleen, do you want me to share my screen instead? <laughs> um, I just want to reiterate that if you uh, have any questions about anything you found in your closet or anything you purchased new, it's not just about being finding sensors. But if you just don't know if it'll work, um, call us, chat on our website, email us. Um, we're, that's what we're here for. Uh, there's lots of great resources on our website. They're not always easy to find. So this slide deck has a lot of links in them, uh, especially with the sensor specific stuff. I'm not gonna go into great detail, but all the links are there in the slide deck. All right, so we are gonna talk specifically about a few sensors that, especially in the pre-webinar uh, list, a lot of you had questions about. Um, but kind of the first thing to do, like when people are like, I found a bunch of stuff in my closet, how do I know if it works? Plug it in and see if it gives you a reasonable number. Uh, if a temperature probe, plug, if you plug it in and it reads a thousand, it probably doesn't work anymore. Um, if you put plug in a pH probe and it reads 102, it probably isn't working great. And I have some tips and tricks to help you with pH. We're going to talk about O2. We're going to talk about colorimeters and spectrometers, temperature and lab quests. All right, uh, and then you noticed I didn't list a huge list of sensors that we're gonna go over because most of them don't require anything special. So if you have a, a conductivity probe that's been in your closet for 10 years, um, it's probably fine. Uh, it, like, it more likely has a broken switch or a broken connector than it does have any issues with actually like collecting data. Uh, same thing with like force sensors or drop counters or most of the sensors you're going to find in, in your uh, closet. Um, just make sure that when you put them back in your closet that you've rinsed them and made sure that they're dry because most, most of the sensors will be damaged by liquid uh, more than anything else. So, All right, pH sensors, everyone's favorite question. Um, so you found a bunch of pH sensors in your closet and you take them out, take them out of their boxes, whatever they've been stored in. First thing you do is look and see if the storage solution in that bottle right there is translucent. If it is, if it's even there, if there's liquid in that bottle, it should be relatively clear. Um, a lot of times it'll grow a bunch of mold and it'll be really green or black or something like that. A lot of times it'll evaporate over years. So if your pH probes have been in there for 10 years and there's literally no liquid, that's not a good sign. Um, so if you have a case where the bottle is empty or there's no bottle at all and it's just been stored open, um, there's a link right there that has you try shocking the pH electrode to see if you can revive it. Uh, and all the instructions are in there and that will get you to test if you can bring it back. Um, and then if it still has liquid in it, but it's black or green and moldy, then just dump it out, dump out all that solution, do some mild soap and water, clean it uh, with a nice brush, kind of make sure you wash the tip of the pH probe as well, refill it with storage solution and, and move on about your day. Uh, storage solution for the pH probes is a pH 4 buffer with some potassium chloride. It doesn't need to be made super precise. It just needs to be a pH 4 buffer with some potassium chloride. The recipe is there and there's also a link to if you want to make it really the best way possible, um, it's in there. But I just make pH 4 buffer and dump some potassium chloride in it and start filling all my pH bottles that way. The other thing you need to look at before you put it in solution and store it before you want to use it is check to make sure the bulb is intact. You can actually see the little round bulb uh, if you have that style of pH probe. There's several different styles. Um, but if you have that style, then if the bulb is broken or missing, that just needs to be thrown away, electronics recycling. 
uh, it cannot be reused or, or repaired. Nope, go back. We're not done yet. <laughs> um, okay, so if you've gotten all that, uh, all that far and your electrode still has an intact bulb and you've shocked it to revive it or you've refilled the storage solution, in that storage solution, it should read somewhere between three and five. So if you find it in the closet and you pull it out and there's clear liquid in there and it's you plug it in and it's reading three and a half, that's, pro that's a really good sign. Like you can calibrate that pH electrode and start using it. Um, and that's, that's where, that's pH probes uh, in a nutshell. Um, try and store them upright in as climate control as possible to keep from that mold growth. Um, but other than that, that's kind of how you check it when you get it out of the closet. Okay, so let's talk about a few things that you might run into, especially if your stuff's like 10 years old. Uh, the pH probes have changed colors over time. So if you have this translucent black one that was last sold in 2006, so it's almost 20 years old, it is most assuredly dead, you straight into electronics recycling. The translucent blue ones, if you have that all in one unit like that, 12 years old, if you just found it in a closet and it hasn't been used at all, it probably is electronics recycling as well. Still go through some of those steps, plug it in, see what it reads. Um, but if no one's been taking care of it for a while, it's probably pretty old and pH sensors do just die over time. They have solution inside them that needs to be maintained. That's why it needs to be stored wet. Um, so that's probably electronics recycling. We do have some still blue translucent bodied pH probes, but they are a B and C connection. So they wouldn't be an all-in-one unit. And most people have the all-in-one unit. Um, in terms of replacements, so if you have a B and C connection on yours, it looks like that lower right uh, black one there, the Tris compatible. Yeah, that's the BNC connection that has that metallic silver connection. If you found that and you know that electrode's been stored dry, you can't revive it, you just throw away the bottom part, so the electrode part, and you can reuse that amplifier and just purchase from us uh, the BNC pH electrode. So that will save you money over time and um, it's also less wasteful. So if you're replacing pH probes, I highly recommend purchasing the electrodes that can be separated. So that's either the go direct pH or the um, just like the FPH-BTA. All right. Uh, so calibration is the last step before use, especially if your probes are old. We have a couple of videos on the website. Follow those links uh, to see those steps. And then we also did an entire webinar on pH probes that went through all of this stuff I just talked about in detail. Definitely check that out. All right, colorimeters. Um, you could have a lot. We've had lots of varieties of colorimeters over the years, as you can see there. The biggest issues with these is that students um, leave the cuvette in it and put it back in the closet. Um, so if you pull colorimeters out of the closet and see a dried up cuvette in there with probably some food coloring or uh, copper sulfate dried on, on inside there, um, you might have issues. Uh, contact us if that's the case. Um, but it's also something to be aware of when uh, students are putting things away. Make sure those cuvettes are out of there. Spectrometers, this is another huge one. Um, people think, uh, you know, there's always that sticky note on the spectrometer that says doesn't work. Um, so that can mean a lot of things as you all well are well aware of. Um, definitely make sure like you're doing a lot of following a lot of this troubleshooting, making sure your absorbance values are between 0.1 and 1. But if they're old, the lamps do die. Uh, if all are you are seeing from the cuvette hole is like a blue or a purple color, that means that the white light in it is probably dead because that's the first thing, that's the first part of the lamp that will die is the white light part. Um, you can check the output 
the lamp output of your spectrometer. That's what that graph there is. And so if you have a newer spectrometer, it'll have a really high response. If you have a dead spectrometer, it will have part of it will be completely flat. Um, over time, that peak will get lower and lower, but I don't really tell anyone to worry about the actual height of that peak until you start seeing irregularities in your actual like data collection. Um, everyone always wants to know like how long will the lamp last? It is hugely variable on how much you use it. Um, so it's really hard to give a number. It's not like a pH probe where I can say eh, about seven years. Um, I've had some users go through their lamps in five years. I've had some that still have them 15, 20 years. It's really just how much you use it. So if uh, you're concerned about that and you're going to use it a lot, it's going to be shorter. If you're going to use it twice a year, it's going to be a lot longer. Uh, lamp replacements, you cannot do it yourself. You need to contact us for a repair process, and I'm going to talk about that whole process a little bit later. If you have ocean optic spectrometers, you have to contact them for a lamp replacement. Oxygen gas. Let's have Colleen talk about this one since it's her favorite. Yeah, I'll talk about oxygen gas and you can jump in and answer the chemistry questions. <laughs> Just sure. popped in the chat. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So uh, oxygen gas sensors are like a pH probe in that they do have a limited lifespan as well. Um, what's key about these is they need to be stored upright and they also need to be used upright. So I usually recommend people to actually store them in the bottle they come in. Um, one way you know that um, you have a nice brand new sensor is that it should be reading about 20.9%. And what we do see is the, P, the um, oxygen gas sensor does degrade over time. There's an electrochemical cell inside of it that has a limited lifespan. And so what you'll see is over time, that reading is going to drift and decrease. So you will need to calibrate the sensor every so often. One way that we can check how healthy or new that cell is, is looking at either the voltage, if it's a LabQuest sensor, or the relative stability reading, if it's a GoDirect sensor. Uh, what we look at is these two values on the uh, um, LabQuest sensor, if it's less than 1.8 volts, or if the relative stability reading is 55 or less on the um, go direct sensor. This gives us a sign that the electrochemical cell in that sensor is at the, its end of life and needs replacement. Usually we will see this happen anywhere from around six years or so. Um, and what is nice about this sensor is we can refurbish it. So we can change out that internal cell on it and get you a new one instead of you having to buy a brand new sensor. Uh, it's one of those things we highly recommend checking out and doing, and it's an easy way for us to set up a repair for you and you just let us know and we get that process going. Um, just so you know, cost-wise, it's about $100 to replace the cell inside of that oxygen gas sensor. And the more you store it upright, the better it is to keep the life of that sensor. If you store it on its side, it's actually going to decrease the life of it and decrease its effectiveness. All right, Melissa, do you want to go back? Yeah, so um, back to, uh, so if you have BTA sensors, which if you found them in a closet, that's probably what you have. Um, I mentioned temperature sensors earlier. If you plug it in and it reads a thousand. So the reason it's probably reading a thousand is the cable was stored incorrectly. So you can kind of see this when you unpack it from the closet, if it's been wrapped around the sensor, and this is true for any, any sensor with a cable. If you have it plugged in and you wrap it, that strain relief can only take so much and the wires in there will, will break. Um, so if you plug in that temperature probe and it reads a thousand or minus 200 or something completely insane, um, it unfortunately cannot be repaired. It is a dead sensor and you have to, you have to recycle that. Um, if it's a sensor that can be calibrated, you might try in the software 
doing a um, resetting factory default. So sometimes like if you plug in a pH probe and it reads 20 in its uh, storage solution, um, it, that's not necessarily a sign that it's gone bad right away. It is a sign that you should uh, go and plug it into the software while you're by. It's already plugged in because it's reading 20, but go in and restore factory defaults. And if it still reads 20, then I would go through that shocking process and everything we talked about earlier. But um, that that restoring factory defaults in the calibration settings is really, really helpful. Um, and then the last thing is if you have older probes and some of the little tabs on the white square connectors are broken, that doesn't mean that you have to throw away that sensor. There's this little thing called Sugru and that link will take you to a video of how to use it and everything uh, that you can actually reconnect or you can make it so that your connector will still fit in your interface. So the broken tab is not a reason to get rid of the probe um, unlike some of the other things. All right, and LabQuest. Okay, so probably one of our number one questions from customers with LabQuest is, my LabQuest 2 won't turn on. The screen is stuck on one of those very four very pretty screens. We have an entire flowchart that walks you through troubleshooting the LabQuest 2. I highly recommend it. It's really well done flowchart. You just click on the link and it'll walk you through what you need to do to help fix that. And if it doesn't, then you contact us. Um, and the number one thing to, in upkeeping your lab quests is to make sure that you have updated the software on them. So that is a free download off of our website. You basically go to that link and download a file onto your computer. You put that on a USB flash drive and plug that into your LabQuest 2 and the update will start automatically. A lot of people don't think that it will fix whatever's going on with their issue that they're having, but it's not just software. It's not just we changed, we added new sensor support or whatever. It actually, we do a lot of firmware updates through that. We do a lot of bug fixes through that. So it's a really important thing to maintain. We're releasing them not even once a year now. So once a year, uh, double check and see if, if you've updated it. LabQuest 3 is even easier. You can do it over the air. So I know you feel like your LabQuest 3 is like brand new because it is, but we've actually done a lot of updates to LabQuest 3. Um, so make sure you're checking that as well. All right, and then the last thing is the uh, batteries that are inside the LabQuest. Um, this year code, so all the batteries, so if you're having trouble with, um, you know, maintaining any kind of life on them, you need to open up that battery compartment and look at that four digit code that is actually the date code. So the first two digits are the week of the year and the second two digits are the year that that battery was manufactured. Um, so this particular battery is 11 years old and lithium ion batteries typically don't last that long without some type of degradation in uh, ability to hold a charge and or you'll see like swelling and things that can be hazardous. So um, definitely that's a sign it needs to be replaced. Um, and if you want to increase the life of your batteries, when you go at the end of the semester, or if you know they're not gonna be using lab quests for a week or a month, completely power the unit down. It's really easy to just like push the button and think it's been powered down, but you push and hold. You can, we also recommend removing the battery and then storing the battery somewhere that's temperature controlled. Um, so that's that's what there is. And that's for LabQuest 2, LabQuest 3, and then that GoDirect SpectraVis Plus also has a battery in it that's just like these. All right, so to the repair process, you've gone through all that troubleshooting and um, your pH probe still isn't working. Um, if it's over five years old, there's not a whole lot we can do about it. That's our warranty. Um, you can still contact us and we can still help make sure you've done all the troubleshooting as much as possible. Um, 
make sure you document like the troubleshooting you've done. Cause if you just like call us up and be like, my pH probe's not working, we're going to make you go through all those steps again. So like at least mentally, like, remember, yes, I checked the buffer. Yes, I got, you know, I did all these things. Uh, Cause we're going to ask you for that anyways. Um, it's also, and in case you've forgotten or uh, you're trying to tell your coworker like where to get the best troubleshooting resources, go to the sensor's main webpage and click on the support tab. And then the user manual will have a lot of those resources. And then that second link, FAQs and troubleshooting tips will take you to the main FAQ for that sensor. And that has a lot of the troubleshooting that I just talked about. Um, with all the different sensors. Um, and then we did talk a little bit about special cases like with the oxygen gas sensor and with spectrometer lamps. Those do have, so in general, our, our repairers don't have a fee associated with them, even if they are outside the warranty. Um, you do have to pay for shipping to us, then we repair, replace it, and then we pay for shipping back. So we just ask to split the shipping costs with you. But there are certain cases like the lamp on your spectrometer is about $100, the oxygen gas sensor is about $100, and the um, LabQuest, broken LabQuest screens also have a fee associated with them. Um, certain other products, mini GCs, people were asking about. So uh, all of those kind of more, um, there's just special cases that we there is a fee associated with it. Um, it's good to get those repairs in at a time when you know you won't need it because it will be out of your hands for a while, like just with shipping and then getting into our building. It takes like about a week or two for all those things to happen. If you need a lamp replacement, that takes like six weeks because it has to be recalibrated and all this kinds of stuff. So um, just keep that in mind when you start that repair process. But it all starts with just calling, emailing or chatting with us and say, I um, did all this troubleshooting and I need help. So I know I've said the word uh, electronics recycling a lot. I wish I could give you one place to go that would just take care of it for you. The EPA website has some great links that will take you to electronics recycling for your area. You know what though, just Google it and the top five hits that come up will be electronics recycling for your area. When I was kind of researching this, um, a lot of areas have it, uh, but I would definitely do the, that EPA website has some good links on it if you're questioning Google. <laughs> All right, so um, just to kind of point this out again, uh, we do have a lot of videos on our website on how to use a lot of the specific sensors as well. So I highly recommend, um, one of the things I tell people to do is if you find a sensor, find it on our website and you can find the video links on how to use it. You can also find the user manual on how to get and look at that to give you some good tips on using and checking on your sensor if, if it's working or not. Training, that's another big thing we get, is we do um, do personalized training as well. Uh, we have lots of different options for personalized training. Um, primarily, uh, we have the ability to uh, do Zoom now. So yay for Zoom, and we can do a one-hour free training session. Um, if you go to the personalized training tab I showed here on our website, it will have you fill out a form and get some basic information from you. And then we can access, um, basically set up a time to do that training with you. We ask for at least two weeks in advance because there isn't a lot of us. So we have to make sure we can work it into our schedules. Um, and we also can do longer trainings. Those typically do have a cost associated with them. Um, and the same thing with on-site trainings. We can also do trainings on-site, um, but again, there will be a cost associated with those. And it's all the same form to be able to request um, any costs associated with those different types of training there. All right, let me see if there's any other last questions I might not have answered. 
Jason. Okay. Um, so last minute questions here. We, we still have about 10 minutes to go. Um, we might give everybody some time back here if, if we don't have any other questions. But I think the, the biggest thing is to make sure to contact us if you're unsure. That's what we're here for. We actually can look up your school's inventories as well. Um, for the most part, we can actually see how old your sensors are and can kind of give you an idea of what sensors might need replacement or what sensors should still actually be functional for you. Because uh, like Melissa said, there's certain sensors that really don't have much of a lifespan on them. It's more um, about the uh, how, how they were stored and if their cables are still connected. So for example, temperature probes. We have people that are using temperature probes that are over 20 years old. Um, we have gas pressure sensors that are still going strong that are 20 years old. Force sensors. Uh, everything like that is a lot of, um, it just depends on how it was used, if it was used, and how exactly it was stored over time. Um, I'll go ahead and answer this one out loud about the colorimeters. Um, so colorimeters don't need their lamps replaced. They're LEDs. Um, they'll last a really, really long time. Um Spectrometers are the ones I was referring to that need a lamp replacement because they have a broadband source in them. That's the what the white light source. Uh, they are the ones that need a lamp replacement after you know about typically five to ten years. Um, and then it it does also bring up a good question though of like replacing your BTA sensors. Like as you are replacing BTA sensors it is almost entirely worth replacing them with the GoDirect sensors. Um, in most cases, it's a superior sensor because it's newer technology. Um, and in a lot of cases, it has like more features. So like a, uh, for example, a, um, a GoDirect- It's oxygen probe. Uh, uh, sure, go ahead and talk about the- Yeah. <laughs> the so, dissolved oxygen. So for example, the GoDirect dissolved oxygen probe has multiple channels on it now. So not only does it measure dissolved oxygen concentration, but it also will give you the saturation and temperature all at the same time. So you don't have to worry about having, for example, if you're doing water quality, you don't have to have a DO probe and a temperature probe into your body water at the same time. Just the DO probe will do both measurements for you. So it's, a, it's something to definitely consider. Uh, the other thing to note is the cost difference between them is usually not much. Um, and in some cases, the GoDirect sensors are actually a little cheaper than the LabQuest sensors purely because of advancements in technology and everything. Um, we've been able to get better replacements for them. Yeah, and they will sit right next to the BTA sensors. Um, if you just want to stick with that same again, because you ha you're having to move to graphical analysis. So all your instructions, you've went into your Vernier account, you've downloaded all the latest instructions for graphical analysis. So as you're replacing broken BTA sensors, replacing them with GoDirect is going to be seamless because they're all using graphical analysis. Um, so again, I, re I really... Yeah. That. And, and to also make sure, because I'm not sure how clear we were on this, you can use LabQuest sensors and GoDirect sensors at the same time together. So um, you can use a mixed batch of, you know, some students might be using the LabQuest sensors, others using GoDirect. They all will also work together. So it's not one of those you have to have one or the other. It, it's nice that they have the versatility that they can be used intermixed with each other. Yeah, same thing with LabQuest. So if you have a bunch of LabQuest 2s, as you're replacing them with LabQuest 3s, they all the menus are the same, all the screens are the same. So while your students may fight over the newer stuff, 
you will be able to use them seamlessly side by side. <laughs> <laughs> and um, another thing to, to note that somebody had asked earlier, I want to make sure to call out is your LabQuest 2s and your original LabQuests and the LabQuest 3s can plug directly into the USB of a Chromebook and you can use them as an interface that way. You can use them kind of as that LabQuest mini and basically have it being used through graphical analysis where students would do all the data collection on the graphical analysis instead of doing it just on that LabQuest. Um, Cause I believe there's someone who mentioned their LabQuest two is getting a little slow and um, it, it's great with graphical analysis. It works beautifully. And a lot of students get very, um, when things start to move slower, they get very click happy or tap happy. Um, I am also guilty of that because you want it to work now. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, so other sensors, really, there's very few that have very specific storage requirements. I mean, like we talked about, mostly we're talking pH probes and oxygen gas sensors. Those are the two that really have a lot of kind of specifics with them um, in storage. It's, it's just a matter of making sure the biggest thing is if you have LabQuest sensors, don't wrap the cable around the sensor. Make sure you have a nice accordion cable tied together and it's not like putting any strain on where the cable connects to the sensor itself. I think we're doing a giveaway, right, Colleen? Click, yes. click, click one more time. So, Dylan, who is the winner of our Go Direct temperature? So I went ahead and I did a random name generator. And today's winner is going to be Kristen R. So congratulations, Kristen. I'm going to go ahead and send you an email as soon as we're done talking today. Um, and we'll just get your information for sending that off. All right. Congratulations, Kristen. Um, so thank you all uh, for attending today and spending your time with us. Uh, this last page here, we have a link to a new web page that we've actually just rolled out um, that kind of deals with all of everything that we've talked about today. It's a found technology web page to help kind of guide you through what, um, what you might have found within your closets. Um, and the other thing, don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, support at vernier.com is a great way for you to get a hold of us, or you can call or even chat us on our website during office hours as well. So thank you again, and um, we hope to hear from you if you have further questions. <laughs>